uh, today I'm going to be talking about Android memory, and specifically Android memory and games from a games perspective. My name is Bill Billadu, and I work with game developers. I'm a developer advocate. And working with game developers, uh, oftentimes I hear th things about memory, um, problems that they have running out of memory. So I want to talk about some of the uh, things about memory and Android, but specific about one of the things I first want to mention before I go into that is uh, there have been some improvements in Q uh, with respect to memory. Uh, so during my slides, uh, I'm going to be uh, showing this Q logo, and that'll kind of help you remember uh, that this is a new, something new in Q. All right. So, what are some of the problems that developers face uh, with memory? The biggest problem is, of course, running out of memory and having your game just crash. Now, Android is different than other platforms. If you take, for example, uh, consoles, uh, you have a fixed amount of memory, and it's, it's much easier to predict how much memory you can use and how much memory to budget for. Uh, in the case of the PC, you have a lot of swap space. So if you start running low on memory, uh, you know, a lot of that memory can be swapped to disk. However, in the case of Android, when it runs low on memory, about the only thing that, happens, that can happen to you that uh, it can do about it is your game gets killed. Okay? So it's not, not, not good. So you want to avoid that situation. And I'm going to be talking about that today, how to avoid that. Now, ideally, game developers would like to have fixed memory budgets. It makes it much easier when you're developing the game. You know, you tell your artists, I have a certain amount for textures, geometry. Um, you know, you can set aside a certain amount for code. But in order to do this, you need to know how big that whole pie is. And, and that's the hard thing to do. Um, because um, in order to do this, you need to know the size of memory, how much memory is available. So in the case of Android, you can say, one, one answer to this question is as much as possible. But that's still kind of vague, because it depends a lot on the system. Mm, you know, the system can't be taken out of memory. It it's still has to be there. So your game has to share that memory with, with the uh, system. So what this means is there's really no definite fixed size on how much available memory you have. Now I'm hoping that by seeing this talk and learning more about Android memory and understanding how it works, that you'll be able to pre prevent the bad things from happening, like crashes. Now, before I go on, um, I did this uh, memory test. I put together this little app that uh, allocates memory. And every time you press on this red button, it allocates 100 megabytes. And I was able to allocate 4.1 gigabytes on a device that only has four gigabytes of RAM. How is that possible? So first of all, I don't recommend that games do this. It's, you're going to run into other problems if you try to allocate that much memory. But I want you to think about that, and uh, we'll come back to that later. So here are some of the things that I think game developers should know about Android memory. First of all, the Android memory philosophy, it's similar to Linux, because Android is based on Linux. It wants to use all of RAM. If you think about it, free RAM is really doing no one any good. It's just sitting there, doing nothing. So the way Android uses the, all of this RAM is to keep apps in memory. The result of this is, you never really have a lot of free memory on Android devices. 
So why do you keep all of these apps in memory? It's so you can do things like fast app switching. If you have an app that you started and you put it in the background and you go to another app, you're able to switch to different apps because they stay resident in memory. Now, the nice thing about Q, a new improvement in Q, is that we're doing very active compaction of these background apps so that if you have a very large app like your game, for example, you can actually put your game into the background. Users can put your game into the background, and it'll still be resonant and running when it comes back. So let's look at some of the specifics about device memory. There's different types of memory. You can categorize them by size and also by how fast that memory is. So for example, RAM is the fast memory. It's limited in size. It's smaller than other types of memory. One thing to consider about RAM is that it's shared between the CPU and the GPU. So they both are using that memory. Android devices also have secondary storage, right? This is where your apps are stored when they're not being used. This is non-volatile RAM. It's slower than RAM. And, um, but you have a lot more of it. So this diagram really isn't to scale. Another type of RAM that I want to mention, or memory that I want to mention, is ZRAM. And this is compressed memory that the system set aside, sets aside for swapping. So go into a little bit more detail here. What are the different types of memory? Obviously, we have free memory, free, free memory pages. We also have pages that are storage-backed. So this is, these are pages that are stored on that uh, storage, the secondary storage device, and also are in memory. Uh, I, note, I just want to point out, when I say memory, I'm usually referring to RAM. So I'm, I'm using those terms interchangeably. When I talk about storage memory, I'll, I'll usually try to refer to it as storage. Now, there's also clean pages. Clean pages are pages that are storage back, but have not been modified. And you also have dirty pages, which are pages that have been modified. Anonymous memory, you might have heard about that. That's memory that you're allocating, that you allocate through malloc. So what happens when you run low on memory on Android? First of all, there's something in the kernel called kernel swap daemon, or kswapd. And this is responsible for reclaiming memory. So it turns pages that are used into free memory. It does this by swapping pages, or in some cases, deleting the pages. The interesting thing is it runs asynchronously from your game. So here's an example where we've got a storage back page. It's clean. We'll say it's clean, not modified. And it's this pink rectangle here. And let's say we want to reclaim this memory. So what kswapd does is it just deletes the page. Right? Because it hasn't been modified. If it needs it again, it'll just read it in from storage. Suppose you have modified memory. And even if it was storage back, you couldn't just delete it because it would, uh, it would, that those changes would be lost. So what Android can do is swap it into ZRAM, so that partition of memory that's used um, for compressed memory. Now, because it's compressed, it's going to take up less space. So this is a good thing. Android keeps track of uh, certain memory thresholds, uh, both low memory thresholds and high memory thresholds. And it uses these thresholds as triggers on when to do reclaims. Here's an example of how kswapd reclaims memory. Say your application is allocating memory, and this blue line here is the amount of free memory that you have. So as you keep allocating memory over time, that blue line goes down until it eventually hits the low memory threshold. At that point, kswapd kicks in and starts reclaiming pages. So your, memory, your free memory goes back up. 
but you don't want to keep reclaiming page, pages, you know, because some of those pages you want to keep in memory because your, your game might need them. So it stops reclaiming memory, and then if your game keeps re, re, if your game keeps allocating memory, this whole process is going to repeat itself. I also want to introduce this concept here of available RAM versus free RAM. So I consider available RAM to be the free RAM plus any kind of RAM that can be reclaimed by KSwapD. So another part of the kernel that helps to free up memory is something called low memory killer. It's also called LMK, abbreviated LMK. And for each process, uh, it keeps track of an out of memory adjust score. And this score ranges from minus 1,000 to 1,000. The higher the score, the more likely to get killed. So those, get, those with a score of 1,000 get killed first. The ones at the bottom at minus 1,000 have a very low score and are highly unlikely to get killed. So the background apps are, have these high scores. So they're more likely, they're the first ones to get killed. Your foreground app is going to get killed if it has to get killed after all of the background apps. And the system is almost never going to get killed. So uh, all of these system processes, you know, they're not going to get killed before your game. One thing to consider is that OEMs can modify uh, the behavior of low memory killer. So it can vary from different devices. Here's an example of how low memory killer works with a game. Uh, so you have your game here running in the foreground. And it has an out of memory adjust score of 0. And you have these other two apps in the background. Um, and they have out of memory of score of 905 and 900. On the right here, or yes, on the right here, is a little chart showing the available memory. And I'm, we'll see what happens when your game starts allocating memory. OK, so you've allocated memory below this 905 threshold. It's a memory threshold corresponding to the out of memory adjust score. At that point, low memory killer knows that it can kill that process. And because of that, it frees up memory. OK, this is great. So your app just keeps on allocating memory. Eventually, it'll get to the point where it hits this threshold. And now the Chrome app in the background will get killed by low memory killer. If your game keeps allocating, it'll, it'll eventually get to the point where it, well, sorry, it gets more memory back because it killed Chrome. But it'll eventually get to the point where it gets below that zero threshold. And at that point, low memory killer will come in and kill your, your game. So that's how games get killed, because they run low on memory. Um, Android knows that it has to keep a certain amount of free memory around. And it'll even kill your game to make sure that that amount of free memory is available. Fortunately, Android does have something called on-trim memory. On-trim memory is a warning about low memory, that you're, the system is running low on memory, and it's a callback to your game to tell it to do something. Now, in Android P and earlier versions, it's, it wasn't that reliable. Um, there were problems where it was uh, not uh, signaling this on-trim memory, even though you were in a critical stage where you are going to get killed. So games or apps may not have been paying attention to this. Now, this has been improved in Q. Uh, it's, it's using a new trigger now to uh, uh, let the on-trim memory know when to send its call, uh, when to the system to send its on-trim memory call. It's called pressure stall information. Uh, pressure stall information was something introduced in Linux. And it was modified by Android to um, measure the, um, the time it takes to obtain memory. So if you remember, I was talking about KSwapD and low memory killer. These things take time. 
And so as the system runs low on memory, these take more time to reclaim memory and give the app more memory. So pressure stall information measures that. And the longer it takes, when it gets to a certain point, it'll say, OK, now I'm going to warn the app that we're really running low on memory. And that's where an on-trim memory gets called. So I just want to kind of summarize here. You've got low memory killer, case swap D, and then you have your game. And these are all these are running asynchronously. And the problem with that is things tend to happen unexpected. Fortunately, changes in queue, like pressure stall information, should help with this. So what things should your game do to avoid low memory situations? The first thing is respond to on-trim memory. Now we, f we feel that this is more reliable. It re provides reliable signals. So it's something you really should respond to, because it's probably the only warning you're going to get. Now, on-trim memory still has high latency. So it could, uh, you could be running into a, a critical situation, and it may take some time for on-trim memory to notify your game. So when you do get it, you want to make sure you take action. And I mean doing things like trying to reduce the allocations, you know, slow down your allocations, try to remove things from memory if possible. Um, maybe if you've got a lot of shaders resident in memory, you want to evict some of those shaders. Maybe you want to use lower res uh, textures, uh, things like that. And also, because you're running in a low memory situation, you have a greater probability that the game might get killed. So at this point, you might want to consider saving the state of the game. So in, if it does get killed, at least uh, you know, the players who are playing this game are not going to be so frustrated when the game gets launched again. And they haven't lost, uh, lost much. So here's some Java code that shows how you can use on-term memory. So in the uh, main activity, what you can do is make sure you implement um, components callback to. And then you just uh, implement this on-trim memory call. And uh, notice that on-trim memory gets passed a level. And this level corresponds to the severity of the memory situation. So it can be either moderate or low and critical, which is the last one. Uh, there are a few other levels, but these are the ones uh, I think are important, the ones I've looked at. And in my case, the only thing I did was here is pop up a message showing uh, what the memory level is. But in your case, what you would want to do is actually take action and, and try to reduce the memory. So for Unity developers, um, here's an example of a C-sharp script. And um, there's something called application low memory events in Unity. And these correspond to on-term memory calls. So you want to subscribe to this event and then have a callback that gets called when this event happens. So Unity does have this resource unload call, which you can make. Uh, that's one possible thing you can do um, to re uh, reduce the, the memory pressure. So another thing that games should do, and, and most games do this typically, is just to be conservative about their memory budgets. What things you should, should you consider? Well, you should take into account the physical RAM size. And also, you want to look at how much typically does the operating system and system processes use. In this case, it's about 1.5 gigabytes, and it's on a 4 gigabyte uh, device. These can vary over time. So I remember, I was saying, you don't have definite amounts for these. So that's why you want to be conservative. And you also want to look at the maximum amount of ZRAM size. So uh, as I mentioned, ZRAM is something is uses compressed memory. It's used for swapping when memory gets low. So the more ZRAM that you can have, the better your device will be able to handle low memory situations. How do you tell how much ZRAM you have? Well, if you look in the proc meminfo file, 
you can see the swap total is shown here, and that's the, the max amount of ZRAM your device can, can have. So in this case, it's about a gigabyte. If we look at some typical games, this is like kind of a random sampling of games. Uh, on a four gigabyte device, um, the most that these games allocate, uh, these are peak memory usage, is only about 1.23 gigabytes. So they're really not pushing the amount of physical memory uh, up to the limit of physical memory very much. Now, if you can't be really conservative, the other thing is you should be flexible. So this means you need to be more dynamic with the memory instead of fixed. Of course, this means you're going to need to respond to those on-trim memory calls. And because you're now um, taking into account low memory situations and, and hitting up against that limit, you need to do more game memory management and, and really design your game to have a variable amount of memory. Now, be crashing when you run out of memory isn't the only thing that can happen. So at some point when you have lots of memory and everything's working fine, and the point when you crash because you run out of memory, you could hit thrashing. And thrashing is when you have just continuous swapping. The main symptom of it is you have very long delays. Uh, frames could take seconds to execute. Um, and basically, the only thing you can do about that is reduce the working set of your game, you know, reduce the, f the memory footprint of it. So here's an example of how to look for uh, thrashing. Um, we have this tool called SysTrace. Uh, hopefully, you've used it and, and have seen it before. It's part of the Android SDK. And um, if you notice here, it shows uh, processes being executed on the CPU cores. And you notice this one core is just continuously using executing KSwapD. KSwapD, remember, is the one that does the swapping. It, it reclaims memory. So when you see it active that much, it's, you should be suspicious. The other thing to look for is um, your processes are getting into a state where they're blocked on I.O. Because these pages, uh, remember these memory back page, storage back pages have been deleted. So it needs to, they need to read them back into memory when executing. All right, another tip. Um, don't try to, don't allocate too much, too fast. So the speed of allocations can actually matter when you get into really sensitive low memory situations. Uh, as I mentioned, reclaiming memory takes time. So you don't want your allocations to outpace how fast you can reclaim memory. And the result of this, the game gets killed. It gets killed potentially sooner than it, it really needs to get killed. Now, I'm going to talk about some of the tools that we have for, uh, for, for debugging and for profiling native memory. And I, I use the term native here, of course, because we're look, talking about games. And these are, this is memory that's allocated by C++ as opposed to like the Java heap. So one of the tools you can use uh, is a kind of a class of tools, uh, meminfo. And these are just memory statistics. So they include things like ADB shell dump sys meminfo, right? And that gives you uh, some statistics on memory. And similarly, there's something called debug.memoryinfo, which gives you basically the same information. The problem is it's slow. Uh, and the reason why is it's collecting what's called PSS storage. And another problem is it's not always consistent. It, takes in, it gathers information, say, of graphics memory. And graphics memory is collected by the, the GPU driver, which is something Android really doesn't have control over. And it's differs, it, it's different with different GPU vendors. They, not, they may be reporting memory differently than another vendor does, or they may even be reporting it different depending on the version of the driver. So here's an example of what you would see with uh, dumpsys meminfo. Obviously, it shows the Java heap, which 
usually isn't a big part of a, a game because it uses native memory. The native heap is, is probably where most of your memory allocations are going to be coming from. And also the graphics memory, because games do a lot of um, graphics. And it gives you the total here. And I mentioned before, it's slow because it's using PSS. Uh, the other type of memory is called RSS. Um, so what's the difference between PSS and RSS? So PSS is proportional set size. So it includes uh, the private memory that your game is using. And it also includes uh, the shared memory. So if different processes are sharing some of that memory that you're using, it'll include that. But it'll measure it proportionally based on how many processes are sharing that memory. RSS is much simpler. It's just the total pages that your game is using. Uh, we think that RSS is probably more useful for games. Uh, one of the reasons is it's much easier to collect that information. It's faster. Um, the other reason is it just gives you all of the memory that you're, that you're using. Here's an example of how those get calculated. Uh, this game here has uh, five pages. Three of them are private just to the game. And then two of the pages in yellow here are shared with other processes. So if we wanted to calculate PSS, we would take the private pages, or three. And then we have one page is shared between two processes. So that's one half. And then one process that's shared, sorry, one page that's shared between two pro three processes, so that's one third. Then you multiply it all times the page size, and that gives you the total amount of PSS. Now, RSS, as I said, much simpler. We have five pages, and then just multiply it times the page size. Now, one of the new things we've added in Q, this is, uh, I think, really going to be useful for people who want to trace memory or track their memory is RSS trace points. And I mentioned RSS is much faster to collect than PSS memory, so you don't have these delays. And because you don't have these delays, you're not going to miss those peaks uh, where the memory might reach a peak and then go down, but you might miss it because it takes so long to collect that PSS information. And it's great for this new tool called Perfetto. What is Perfetto? Well, if you haven't heard of Perfetto, it's a new tool that actually resides on the device. And it collects information on the device. It can do things like heap profiling, which I'll show later. And the really, really interesting thing, I think, for games particularly, is it can collect arbitrarily long traces. So this means that you can run your game through an entire level and be collecting all of this trace information. You can see all, how your memory changes in, with very high detail over the entire length of that um, session that you're collecting. Some of the other things it can do, it has offline. You can do offline processing because uh, it has an SQL query that you can do on the data. And you can collect that information yourself and do your own analysis of it. Also, it has a new UI, similar to SysTrace, uh, called Perfetto UI. So to enable it on your device in the developer settings, go to System Tracing. And make sure you enable Perfetto here. Uh, you also want to enable long traces and also trace debuggable applications. Then go to the Category section. And make sure memory is checked. Because if you're collecting memory, you want to make sure that's checked. Then you just hit Record Trace, and it starts tracing. And you'll get this notification. And uh, when you're done tracing, just tap that notification. Here's an example of uh, Perfetto UI uh, for tracing memory. And you can see how. It collects uh, this memory information about anonymous memory and, and various types of RSS memory over time. So you can see how the memory is growing over time. Um, so now that we uh, have these tools to collect all of this information, I want you to remember back when I talked about this test app. 
And why, does it, why is it able to allocate 4.1 gigabytes? So let's look at it with Perfetto. If you look at uh, the memory over time, and this is more towards the end of the, collect of the allocations, we can see how the anonymous memory, the, the malloc memory, starts to flatten out. That's the part on the top here. However, um, the swap memory continues to go up. Now remember, swap is stored in ZRAM, and ZRAM is compressed mem memory. So all of this memory is compressed. So even though it says 4.2 gigabytes, that 1.7 is all compressed memory, so it takes up less space. So here's this app running. Um, you can see as I'm tapping here on the bottom, the memory keeps going up. And I want you to notice here, as we get around to 2 gigabytes, we get our first on-term memory warning. It says it's running low. Uh, we keep uh, allocating memory. And at 3 gigabytes, it gets critical. I start to slow down on the tapping to allocate slower. And notice now we can hit 4.1 gigabytes. So it really does work. Once again, I don't recommend allocating that much memory. More than likely, you're going to start thrashing when you get to that much memory. So the other tool I wanted to mention here, another tool, is Heap Profty. And this is also part of Perfetto. It's used for memory tracking, memory debugging, finding memory leaks. It's much easier to use than malloc debug. You basically just run a script. You don't have to instrument your game. So very easy to use. And the other nice feature about it, it has very low overhead. So you can run your game much faster. It doesn't get slowed down like it does with malloc debug. Here's uh, an example of some output from Heaprofty. If I zoom in here, uh, hopefully you can see this. Every line here is an, uh, an allocation that hasn't been freed yet. And it shows the function associated with that memory allocation. So you know, if you see some memory here that's, been, that's still allocated, that's not free, where you expected it to be free, that would be an indication of a memory leak. Another tool uh, that's often over overlooked is bug report. Now, when I say bug report, I don't mean taking, uh, you know, making a report and sending it to us as a bug. Uh, what I'm talking about is the tool that uh, collects log information. It's similar to something like ADB Logcat, only it's much more detailed. And the really good thing about it is it shows low memory killer activity. Uh, the other nice thing about it, it can be captured after a crash happens. So you don't, you don't need to instrument your game and you know, expect when a crash is going to happen. If a crash happens and you just noticed it, you then just take a bug report. So to capture a bug report, you once again go into the developer options, and you tap on this Take Bug Report. And in a couple of minutes, this notification will come up telling you that a bug report has been captured, and you can tap on it and then share it with yourself. Another way to do this is to just call AD, or just run ADB bug report, and um, you can get the information that way. Here's an example of um, a bug report log file. And if we're looking for um, memory killing, we can search for this low memory killer uh, kill and then your package name to see if your uh, game was killed. And I, if you can see this, there's a whole bunch of low memory killer activity going on here because we're running low on memory and it's killing those processes that aren't needed so it can free up memory for your game. Um, so in this instance, yes, the game, the app was killed by low memory killer. So in case your, your game is crashing for some unknown reason, this will let you know it was killed because it ran low on memory. So just to summarize here, um, some things I think are good to remember. Android, unfortunately, has no guarantees for the amount of available memory that you have. The things to look out for are obviously crashing. That's the really bad one. And then also thrashing can happen. And that really is bad for performance. 
Uh, and I mentioned some of the new tools in Q, and hopefully you can use them to uh, find out what's going on and prevent these bad things from happening uh, in low memory situations. And finally, uh, you know, I'm hoping that now that you understand uh, how Android memory works, you can put this uh, to use in your game. Also, I want to remind people that we're doing game reviews. So if you have a game you'd like us to review, um, you can go uh, back here in the garage section to uh, have us look at your game. And that's it. And I have some uh, links here. Uh, in particular, you might be interested in the Perfetto link. It's just uh, perfetto.dev, pretty easy link here. And also, uh, in that Perfetto documentation is some description of uh, HeProfD. So um, that's it. Thank you. <laughs>